Assembly Member Garcia is not here. Okay. Oh, that's. Uh, it's on. It's right here. Right. What happened to item five? Oh, okay. that's on consent. Okay. Assembly Member Waldron, please uh, come join us. This is uh, file item six, AB 380. And good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. AB 380 will simply clarify in statute that only an innocent party in a void or voidable marriage can be declared a putative spouse and be awarded a community share of the property that was accrued during said marriage. AB 380 passed the assembly floor 79 to zero. Here I have with me Larry Doyle representing the sponsor of the bill. Where is he? Well, he's He's here. Uh, I know we've got gender neutral names more and more these days, but I don't see someone who looks like a Larry up there. So Larry, if you'd like to join us, okay. Um, he is representing the sponsor of the bill, the Conference of California Bar Associations. Fariba R. Sarush with the Executive Committee of the State Bar of California and Mikaline Insalaco with the Certified Family Law Specialists who are all in support. Thank you. Thank you. First witness, Mr. Doyle. Okay. Um, I didn't want to spend the time because we have two true experts be behind me. So I represent the Conference of California Bar Associations. We're the sponsors of the bill, and we uh, would appreciate the committee's support. All right. So we'll use that as the me too. And if the, either of the two of you want to present for a couple minutes, uh, we have the opportunity for two people to do that at two minutes each. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Michaeline Insalaco with uh, on behalf of the California Conference of Bar Associations, I'm a family law attorney in San Francisco and a former member of Flexcom and a member of ACFLS. In California, if two people marry when one of them is already married and it's a bigamous marriage, there is no marriage. And the courts created the doctrine of putative spouse to protect a person who married in good faith and thought they were getting married. So at the end of the day, if the parties separated, they had the right to spousal support, they have the right to attorney fees and community property. This uh, common law doctrine was <clears throat> codified and there's an anom anomaly because only the putative spouse can receive spousal support and fees, but if the court finds one spouse is the putative spouse, under a case called Deheja, it's mandatory that the property be divided even if the person who was the good faith innocent party prefers not to be forced into the doctrine. So for instance, in the Teheja case, the wife acquired property. Her husband uh, knew he had been married before. He knew it was a bigamous marriage, but the court forced her to give him half her property even though they weren't really married because that's the way the statute was interpreted. Then another case came along, the Go and Son case, and said, no, that's not the equitable result. That's not the intended legislative intent. So we have a split of authority which creates litigation and confusion and it makes it harder for attorneys to predict uh, what will happen and to help settle cases. <clears throat> Since then, the Supreme Court has clarified in the case called Seja that the court has broad discretion to determine a person is a putative spouse. They only have to have a sincere and good faith belief in the marriage. So whether it's objectively reasonable or not, if they really truly believe they were married, married the court can protect them, whether it's a husband or a wife, so the courts have broad discretion now to determine that there was a putative spouse and that it is equitable to apply the doctrine of community property. So the only thing that this case, this statute would do is to clarify the community property aspects of the putative spouse codes, to clarify that if there's only one putative spouse and the other one has no good faith belief in the, belief in the marriage and really actively defrauded the other person, that person can't force the other to opt into community property. Thank you. Thank you. Next witness. Good afternoon. My name is Fariba Sarouche. I'm an attorney. I'm a family law facilitator and a self-help attorney for Santa Clara County Superior Court. Today I'm here representing the family law executive section of the State Bar of California. 
We also support this bill for two reasons. One, I, I just want to reiterate that it will reduce litigation by clarifying the law as between the two decisions, Tejeda, which was decided in 2010, and uh, Marriage of Guao and Son, uh, that was decided, um, excuse me, Tejeda in 2009 and uh, Guao and Son in 2010. We also believe that this uh, bill will bring into alignment uh, how property rights are treated in the family code, in nullity actions, with how spousal support and attorney's fees are treated under the family code. Currently, only uh, putative spouses can be awarded spousal support and attorney's fees. However, it is not so clear as to property division. So the only fair result can be, as said in marriage of uh, Guao and Son in 2010, that putative spouses be allowed to ask for property division and be awarded uh, those rights. And that the court cannot do the same over and above the objections of the putative spouse. So we ask for an I vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other witnesses in support? Are there any witnesses in opposition? I just have a question as a practical matter. This, uh, did you want to ask a no. question? Okay. Um, well, thank you. Um, uh, given how the courts are crying that, and, and legitimately, that they just don't have time uh, today, especially in, in a court like San Francisco, to have hearings to make a lot of these determinations, how do you see this playing out if there becomes even, if you will, uh, more importance uh, to addressing and having a fact finding as to whether or not a, a spouse is truly a putative spouse, an innocent spouse. Is this going to create uh, more crowding or is, th is there a way you envision that this can be addressed uh, without further um, exacerbating the, the, the problems that the courts are getting cases heard in a timely fashion? So this bill will only reduce litigation because it will resolve a conflict between the appellate courts. So that way people will know what the actual rule is. Either way, if you have a nullity action, there's a bigamous marriage, someone has to go into court and prove that they're a putative spouse for any of this to apply. So there has to be a fact-finding decision either way. It's just the question is, they apply. if I'm the putative spouse and I'm happy not to give the other person my property and happy not to have spousal support, I can just opt out file for nullity, the marriage is null, that's it, there's no litigation. On the other hand, without this bill, my spouse could come in and say, wait, 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 because you, because I fooled you and you believed in good faith we were married, I get your property. So it would, it, it can only reduce litigation. There's other, without the bill, there's more likelihood for litigation over in both of those scenarios. Uh, yes, and then uh, Senator Wojcicki, did you want to speak? Senator so Leno, then. Bear with me as a non-attorney. Fascinating subject. And I understand the intent of the bill, certainly. But with regard to the putative spouse doctrine, and help me with this a little bit, it, it was intended to, it's a doctrine to clarify that even though in the case of the example you gave where one spouse has been tricked and it's not a real marriage, that the doctrine would give the legal rights as if that person were a legal spouse. Correct. And okay. it often gives the rights to both parties. Oftentimes right. someone mistakenly marries not realizing their first marriage was invalid. Right. That person can be a putative spouse too if they actually believe sincerely and honestly. So intent is, of course, a consideration here. The, the Supreme Court's language is a sincere and honestly held belief. That's the test. But I just wanted to better understand that with this allowance as proposed in the bill, it actually changes the doctrine of putative spouse because it would give this spouse that we're talking about here actually more decision making than a putative spouse, which we want to make equal to a real spouse. Uh, would otherwise get. Um, can I just... So if, um, if I would ask you to compare the property division rights to spousal support and attorney's fees. Currently, the law says the court can award spousal support and attorney's fees only to the putative spouse. 
property rights are not treated the same, and for that reason, the law is not clear, and it would lead to more litigation. If this section, the property rights section, were to be brought into alignment with the other two section, this, that spouse is not given any more rights. It's just clarified that these are the rights you have once you've been found to be a putative spouse. So all the work, and Senator Jackson, if I may um, also pose, address your question earlier, that all the work, work of the judges and the courts will go into deciding who is the putative spouse, and the rest is easy, because that's the prerequisite. That's kind of the seminal finding. And as someone who works for the court for the last 17 years, I can tell you that that is, it will be a tremendous relief for our judges. So what's being proposed would not allow the putative spouse to be able to decide if property is community or not? It allows a person to say, I decline to be found a putative spouse. I'd rather just have my marriage annulled and not have any rights of marriage since I really was never married in the first place. So it's, it's permitting someone not to have something sort of forced upon them that's meant to protect them. Okay. Thank you, Senator. I'm sorry, was there anything further? Okay. All right, so the question's been answered. Any other uh, questions? All right, motion, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead and close if you would. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee. I urge an I vote. Thank you. Motion? I move. We'll give Senator Wykowski the motion at this one. All right, there is a motion. Do pass to the Senate floor. Please call the roll. Jackson. Aye. Jackson. Aye. Morlock. Aye. Morlock. Aye. Anderson. Aye. Anderson. Aye. Hertzberg. Hertzberg. Aye. Leno. Aye. Leno. Aye. Monning. Aye. Monning. Aye. Wykowski. Aye. Wykowski. Aye. Seven to zero. That Seven to zero. That bill is out. Thank you very much for being here in your testimony. Assembly Member Chu. File item 418, it is, uh, excuse me, AB 418, it's file item 7. Good afternoon, Mr. Chu. Good afternoon. Madam Chair and Senators, I appreciate your consideration of AB 418, which would remove the sunset date of an existing state law, which was originally authored by Senator Leno on this committee, that has allowed that has allowed survivors of domestic violence to terminate residential leases early in order to move to safer housing. AB 418 would also decrease a survivor's remaining rent obligation from 30 days to 14 days. And I first want to start by thanking the committee consultants for their work as well as for Senator Leno's principal co-authorship of this bill. We all know that to survive domestic violence, sexual assault, elder and dependent abuse, or human stalking, the ability to leave a dangerous situation can be the difference between life or death. In fact, over half of all sexual assaults occurs where a survivor lives. Unfortunately, many survivors can't leave life-threatening situations because of residential leases and rent obligations. A recent study found that over three quarters of sexual assault victims living in public housing wanted to relocate because the perpetrator lived nearby but couldn't due to the lack of funds and housing options. This bill would allow survivors to continue to terminate their leases early. If Senator Leno's current law sunsets at the end of this year, a survivor could only terminate a lease through a much more onerous process, which is dangerous for survivors, particularly immigrants for whom English is not their first language. AB 418 would also decrease the remaining rent required for someone to leave from 30 to 14 days, funds desperately needed by survivors for new housing. This bill passed the assembly uh, by 78 to zero vote. It's a, it's a common sense policy, not only for survivors, but also for neighbors and landlords. I wanna thank the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence, the Western Center, the National Housing Law Project for being our original co-sponsors, as well as the California Apartment Association for coming on board as a supporter, along with three dozen other family, housing, tenant, and safety organizations. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to witnesses. Very good, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Krista Nimzik. I'm with the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence. We are the statewide domestic violence organization representing over a thousand advocates and organizations across the state. Um, we're pleased to co-sponsor AB 418 and are glad to be back talking about this issue. Um, as was mentioned, the bill in part removes a sunset date on documentation for survivors. 
since the additional documentation passed into law and became effective in 2014, we've seen the positive impacts this can have. One example is that of Kathy. Um, Kathy was in an abusive relationship for three years with her batterer. Um, during this time, he strangled her, hit her, and threatened her life many times. She eventually called the police and he was ultimately put on probation. He served a portion of that out of state but came back to the community and began threatening her and harassing her again. Um, she reached out to the advocate at the local domestic violence program she'd been working with, um, mentioned that she was fearful for her safety because he still knew where she lived. The advocate was able to write a letter to the landlord that served as documentation. She was able to um, terminate her lease early and relocate to safe housing. Another example is that of Micaela, who was being stalked by her ex-boyfriend. He would routinely leave messages detailing her daily activities that he observed while he sat outside her apartment and watched her. Um, she eventually had enough, and the advocate at Human Options that she worked with drafted a letter on her behalf. She presented that to her apartment manager and was able to break her lease. Those are just two of the many stories that we've heard just since 2014. Um, this is a good policy that helps survivors get to safety they need by shortening the amount of notice and obligation to their current landlords that let them move faster. Um, California has such high rents that for survivors to have to carry dual rents is an incredible burden. So we appreciate all the hard work that's been done on this and urge your I vote on this bill. Thank you. It does kind of call into question why it is that the victim has to leave rather than put the burden on the perpetrator. But, right, but uh, that being said, thank you for your testimony. Yes. Uh, thank you. My name is Deborah Carlton with the California Apartment Association. We're the largest rental property association in the nation, about 50,000 rental property owners with about 2 million units all the way from the Oregon border uh, down to San Diego. You know, it's unfortunate that this is, uh, this is a common occurrence in our buildings. Um, we have found that it is much easier um, to provide the amenity, meaning to move the, the victim or allow her to move. And in some cases, as, as, as you point out, um, if the perpetrator lives with her, we now have have the ability to actually lock him out. You already passed that law uh, several years ago. So in some cases, she doesn't have to leave, but we are allowed to change the locks. That's current current law. Um, so that's very helpful in some cases. She doesn't have to leave. But when she does, our owners have found that is certainly um, a, a health and safety issue, not only for her, but often for the other tenants in the property. Um, so for that reason, um, we are supporting the bill. It doesn't change anything with relationship to security deposit law. If there are already other tenants that she has lived with, you don't return the security deposit, quite frankly. I know there's been some confusion about how that works, but you don't return the security deposit in those cases. So in other words, the landlord isn't unjustly burdened, um, but of course she would be allowed out of her lease. So that's very helpful. And that's the most appointed part of this legislation that we think is very helpful. So we request your I vote. Thank you very much. Next witness, very briefly. Uh, good afternoon, Anya Lawler on behalf of the Western Center on Law and Poverty here in support. Thank you. Rebecca Gonzalez, National Association of Social Workers, California chapter in strong support. Thank you. Other witnesses in support? Christopher Castrillo on behalf of the city and county of San Francisco and the Office of Mayor Edwin Lee in support. Thank you. Hello, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Mariah Kayla Watson on behalf of the American Civil Liberties Union of California and we're in support. Thank you. Other witnesses in support? Uh, Senator Hertzberg, did you have a question or do you want to wait until the opposition? Very good. Uh, opposition, please come forward. All right. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair. My name is Eitan Zaitsu. Uh, I represent uh, the Department Association of California Southern Cities, Department Association of Orange County, East Bay Rental Housing Association, uh, NorCal Rental Property Association, North Valley Property Association. Okay. Unfortunately, we are opposed, but we're only opposed to one aspect of the bill, um, which could be categorized as a logistical or a technical issue. But I'd first like to start off by saying we support the intention of the bill. We uh, support added protections for victims of domestic violence, and we support uh, victims of domestic violence, uh, their ability to be able to get out of uh, their leases earlier. Having said that, this bill uh, 
presents certain problems when a victim of domestic violence shares a dwelling with other tenants. Um, typically, when, a, uh, when multiple tenants share a dwelling, landlord receives one rent check per month. Landlord has no idea how, uh, how much each tenant has paid, what percentage they pay. The landlord just receives one rent check. Um, in this case, when, and tenants split up their, their rent in many different ways for many different reasons. Sometimes the person who gets the master bedroom pays more. Sometimes it has to do with how much each person earns in, uh, for their income. Uh, in this situation, under this bill, if, a, if rent comes in on the first of the month, one of the tenants wants to get out of the lease because this person becomes a victim of domestic violence, say on the fifth of the month, that means this person is going to leave the dwelling on the 19th. The landlord would owe that tenant some money back. To, to, as a prorated amount for the last 11 days, landlord has no idea how much to give back to that tenant. Um, and this is the central reason we object at this point because it puts a, the landlord in a position to try to assess how much to pay back to that one tenant. Are, are you assuming that each person has signed the lease? Typically, each, each person uh, does, there's one lease. There's right. one lease typically. And there's a, a sum that's owed. So if you owe $1,000 and there are six people who live there, they divide up amongst themselves, but somebody owes $1,000 at the end of the month. Why does the, I mean, what is the landlord's concern there? If that's the case, if, they're, if they are jointly and severally liable, if this bill doesn't change that aspect, then right. there is no problem. Well, I didn't see anything in the bill that does. Would you answer from? The, the, the bill does not change that. You're always jointly and severally liable. Sure. In fact, all the contracts are written that way, so you wouldn't owe any money back. They, the $1,000 is still owed. Yeah, in fact, the other tenants are the ones that are going to have to ante up the, the differential. So why, I don't understand. If that's the why. case, then we don't have an objection. Okay. Uh, Senator Hertzberg. Yeah, I mean, are these... Well, often you'll have, you have somebody rent. Look, my only thought was this. I support the concept, but you have folks often, certainly my kids as roommates going to school and stuff, you got the bigger room, you pay an extra $200 or whatever the case may be. So we don't know what that is. And they always, of course, have me co-sign. But irrespective of that, <laughs> you know, you got that problem. And my only concern is when you get, you know, uh, the chair and I are working a lot on this whole uh, judicial branch and what you do, and certainly unlawful detainers is a big problem. So I was just worried about the mechanics of what, how this gums up the unlawful detainer courts. If, in fact, you, you have joint and several liability and there's multiple tenants, then you're right. It's not a big deal. The person leaves because you, you don't pay in arrears for rent. You, like with mortgage, you pay in advance for rent. So if you're going to leave, you've already paid that portion of rent, right? That goes to the point. So you pay in advance on rent. You never pay in arrears. So you pay such and such. You leave half the month. And then... Right? Do they, they have to give it back to you under this bill? The bet? If you're just a sole, if you're if you're a sole tenant, how does that work? I'm just trying to get the mechanics because what I'm trying to get to is policy's great. <clears throat> Let's not have unintended consequences of further gumming up the courts where people are dealing with unlawful detainers for both sides of the case because it's not good for our judicial branch. Right. The, the, the bill doesn't change that. That's a, currently an issue today, right? So you have roommates all the time. Yeah, exactly. Moves out. They don't get along. They fight. Somebody moves out. But Can we stop for a second? Let's stop just real quickly. Sure. Simple case. One tenant, domestic violence, middle of the month, $1,000 a month. They've prepaid their 1000 bucks. They leave a mo uh, two weeks in advance. They're now entitled to their 500 bucks back because they left early. That correct. one's correct. Correct? That's okay. correct. That's scenario number one. The landlord's got to give them back their $500 because they've got an urgent situation where their life is threatened and they got to go. Uh, certainly associate with the remarks about why the victim has to leave, but often that's the case. Second scenario, there's, there's $900 a month and you've got three tenants in the place and one is subject to, to uh, and again, the rent's paid, middle of the month, one subject to domestic violence and leaves. So let's just keep it simple, 300, 300, and 300. What happens there? So actually Under the, the law, if this bill is enacted. Well, and even the existing statute says the remainder of the tenants are still obligated under the lease. So it even speaks to that. But that's, again, the same exact situation today. You, you have it all the time in university towns. They can't get along. Somebody moves out. The remaining two tenants are still responsible. They don't get any money. That... that tenant who exits doesn't get any money back. She can probably ask the other two tenants. They could work it out, but that's up to them. 
And if it, I could, remains. Yeah. And if I could also just 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 add the the difference that we're talking about between the handful of apartment associations that have raised this issue and the California Apartment Association and my office and and the supporters is uh, the difference of the status quo of 30 days versus 14 days. And uh, the fact of the matter is the law is already clear that when it comes to 30 days, how it gets apportioned, we're simply saying let's make that 14 days rather than 30 days. The same principle. Madam Chair. Right. Yes. Thank you. Well, first of all, thanks to my colleague from San Francisco for authoring the bill. When we did this a few years ago, we placed a sunset in the bill specifically to appease some of the stakeholder opposition. And as we do when we cover new ground is put our toe in the water, give it a try so we can come back and revisit. It's very heartening to hear the real life stories that there are things that we do here that really have positive impact and that we didn't cause any trouble along the way. So now we're here to remove the sunset. That's a great thing. With regard to this issue of 30 versus 14 days, when I first heard of the concern from this handful of uh, property and apartment associations, my first thought was, let's ask the California Apartment Association how you are, concern how you are dealing with this particular change, and you've already expressed your clear understanding of what the proposed change in law would do. Now that it's clear, I would have the full expectation that the remaining opposition with better understanding will not only remove their opposition, but join the California Apartment Association in support. We, we certainly would remove our opposition and potentially we will support the bill. But at this point, we would remove our opposition on the clarity that the joint and several liability clause uh, that is in existence today, that's, that's part of the law today. Could, could I just ask the Apartment Association, California Apartment Association, to clarify for us where you get your certainty and yes, see if there's on, anything to change. I don't think there is. Yeah, on page five, if I believe I'm pointing at the right section, uh, line 27, nothing this section relieves a tenant other than the tenant who is and who is a household member who is a victim of domestic violence uh, or abuse of the elder, et cetera, from the obligations under the lease or the rental agreement. So lines 29, 30, 31, 32. 27. That is existing law 32. today. Right. That's existing, that's existing statute, yes. Right. And it's referenced in the analysis on page three, one, two, three, four, the fifth, the fifth paragraph re referencing existing law. So that will not I don't change. See much ambiguity in that. Correct. Right. Well, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. So that. Thank you. That is existing law. It's not affected by this bill. It's joint and several liability. It'll be up to the tenants to work it out amongst themselves. It doesn't affect the landlord. They get. They get their rent at the beginning of every month as required under the terms of the agreement. Any other questions? All right. Um, motion by Senator Leno. Uh, Assemblymember, would you like to close? I want to thank many of you who supported this bill in 2013, particularly Senator Leno, uh, for your original authorship and respectfully ask for your I vote. All righty. Um, the motion is due passed to the Senate floor. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Jackson? Aye. Jackson? Aye. Morlock? Morlock, aye. Anderson? Aye. Anderson, aye. Hertzberg? Aye. Hertzberg, aye. Leno? Aye. Leno, aye. Monning? Aye. Monning, aye. Wachowski? Aye. Wachowski, aye. Seven to zero. That measures out. Thank you, Thank Senator. Thank you, Senator.